All righty, this is our last week in the Good News series, Good News About the Kingdom of God. We've been on this journey for the last few weeks exploring these two realities that are present for all human beings. We have the physical reality, the world that we live in, the wonderfully comfortable bench that you're seating on, and uh, everything that we can see and taste and touch, all this stuff is, is temporary, but it's part of life, the way we have to deal. And then there's the spiritual reality of the kingdom of God, where things are invisible. You can't see them, taste them, touch them, but they're just as real, and those things are eternal. And what God has invited his people to do, the church family to do, is be a part of bringing the kingdom of God, the, the spiritual reality, to earth. So we've been talking about the good news uh, that the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is coming to earth, that God's perspective on the world that we live in is coming into play through his church. I wish it always felt like that's what the church was doing in the world, but that's, that's on us. That's, we have to make some choices about how to bring the kingdom of God perspective to bear on the things of this world. So we need to understand what it is that God has to say about things like money. So today we're going to talk about the good news about money. And uh, you, you may be thinking, the good news about money would be if you had some for me. Like if you were going to, you know, let's, let's do the reverse offering thing. You pass the plate and we get to take stuff out. Yeah, let's do that. That would be good news about money. Um, money doesn't seem to be a, a really positive subject these days, right? Uh, because I think we always view it from our perspective, from what I have compared to what other people have. Uh, this was really painful for me during the Major League Baseball strike this year because I just wanted to watch baseball uh, instead of read reports about wealthy people fighting over money. Like, that just didn't feel like the thing that made me want to watch, like, this sport that I love, it seemed very disruptive. And I view it from my perspective. I think, it, how, how, how do the people with all that money have something to fight over when it comes to money? So I'm sure there's stuff I don't know about all of that, but I didn't like it because I'm viewing it from my perspective, and I couldn't watch baseball for a couple weeks, which was kind of a bummer. Uh, but that's, that's how we do. We, we look at what other people have. We see it from perspective of like co a comparison between what I have and what somebody else has. We even, we even view, oh, ooh, dude, let's, let's, let's raise your blood pressure. Let's talk about inflation. We, we even view inflation this way. We, have, we view inflation based on how it impacts me, right? Because that's really what matters most, isn't it? How does it impact me? I don't know what this graph means. I just know it looks scary, okay? <laughs> so... Uh, just be aware, I did a Google search for an inflation graph. This came up, looked, looked good, it's a reputable source. I, inflation is scary because it impacts us, but who does it actually impact the most? If you think about if the cost of groceries goes up $10 a week for the average family, who does that impact the most? A family making $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year or the family making $20,000 a year? Who's the most impacted by inflation? We always think about it from our perspective, and it causes us to have certain feelings about what's going on in the world. And the world is so much bigger than me and, and my perspective, right? If it's really true that the kingdom of God is coming to earth, if you remember this from uh, Andy's message on justice when we talked about this a few weeks ago, he showed us this picture, and it's these two circles that are supposed to be converging. Heaven is taking over earth. That's what Jesus tells us to pray for in the, the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. He said, pray this, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the job of the church to step into this. So we better know what God thinks about things like money so that we can bring that kingdom perspective to earth because it's good news that the kingdom is here, right? If it's good news that the kingdom is here, then it should be good news when, to how we think about our finances and our money. So we're going to look at a couple different stories today that's going to help us see um, some, the good news about money, which we're going to start with this. The good news about money is it does not define me. It does not control me. Did I say those backwards? Yep. It does not control me. It does not define me. One of the temptations that we have when we think about our financial situation and the anxiety that we have uh, in, uh, over this, or how much I have, how much I wish I had, how much I used to have, and I don't have it anymore. Or... So we have this, this anxiety and fear that builds in, and that's a sign that we are being defined or controlled by our money. We don't want to be controlled by anything, do we? We're, we're Americans. We're independent. We're free. You can't control me. And yet we allow our thoughts and our behaviors about our finances to impact us mentally, psychologically, our behaviors. The good news of the kingdom is that money does not control me 
or define me. So we're going to look at a couple stories from Luke chapter 19. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open that. Uh, they still make those, right? Yeah. Uh, I think there's some under the pews if you want an old school. Or you can just read off the screen or on your, your cell phone or however you do that. Luke chapter 19, we're going to start with a story about a wee little man named Zacchaeus. Do you guys know the song? Anybody grow up in church? You sang the Zacchaeus was a... All right, we'll all get together. We'll sing that later outside in the hallway. It'll be, it'll be a great time. Tia will lead us. It'll be awesome. Uh, let's read about Zacchaeus. Luke 19, 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. In classic gospel... Uh, style. This is a big understatement to say that he was wealthy. Jericho was a major financial city uh, and a lot of money passing through there. And so the tax collectors in that city, they kind of had a sweet gig uh, because they worked for Rome. They're collecting taxes from the Jewish people and they kind of get to charge whatever they want. The chief tax collector is the guy kind of at the top of that pile. It's possible Zacchaeus was the wealthiest Jew in the entire city of Jericho. So we're thinking like, I mean, this is Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk type wealth. This guy is extremely wealthy, but Luke is downplaying. He just, he's a wealthy guy. So uh, verse three, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Well, what makes him a sinner? How does everyone else think of Zacchaeus as a sinner? All we know about him is that he's a tax collector and he's wealthy. Well, in their minds, a tax collector was a sinner. Like, those two things were synonymous. Those ideas were synonymous with each other. Because the tax collector's were betraying their own people to go and work for the enemy, the Roman government, and to do for the enemy what the Jews felt was oppressive and harsh to them by taking more than really what they should have taken in their taxes and their collecting. So in the, in the minds of the Jews, the tax collectors, we, they're not even part of us anymore. We, we've disowned them. We've rejected them. They're on the outside. And so the only society that tax collectors get to live in, that the Romans didn't like them either. It was all the other outcasts. So they had this category for outcasts of Jewish society. They just called them sinners. If you didn't fit in some way, you were a sinner and therefore you're out. And the only people you can hang out with are other sinners. So if you ever wonder why Zacchaeus had to climb a tree, why couldn't he just, I mean, short people figure stuff out, right? You, you just work your way to the front of a crowd, right? Well, he couldn't do that. The people weren't going to let him work their way. They didn't like him. So if he tries to push his way to the front, he's going to elbow in the chin probably at some point. So he knows this. He knows the drill. So he climbs a tree to see Jesus because even Jesus draws people like Zacchaeus. So Jesus says, I, I got to come to your house. Um, Zacchaeus would have been shocked by this. No one wants to go to Zacchaeus' house except sinners. Jesus is a respectable person, so respectable. People are lining the streets to see him. And he tells this guy, that no respectable person would even speak to, I want to come and have dinner with you. All right, so let's pick back up in the verse next, whatever number that is. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So Zacchaeus meets Jesus, has him over for dinner. Everyone's mad about it. And then in the, in the middle of dinner, he gets up and he makes uh, some very bold statements about his own personal finances. Doesn't that sound like a great dinner to you? Do you want, look, why don't we all get together and then we'll just, we'll have dinner and we'll go around and everyone stand up and tell us some personal things about your finances. Doesn't that sound like a good time? This is what he does. Why is Zacchaeus' response to meeting Jesus a financial response? You ever wonder that? Here's why I think it is. Because I think when we encounter Jesus, he confronts the thing in our lives that is most likely to separate us from God, that is most likely to be an obstacle between us and surrender to our Heavenly Father. And for Zacchaeus, 
that was his money. There was a reason he chose this profession. And it wasn't to be popular because it did the exact opposite of that. He liked money. There's no way around it. And so his response to meeting Jesus, Jesus confronts in him the thing that is most likely to be an obstacle between him and Jesus. And Zacchaeus' response is, I'm not going to let this control me and define me. I want Jesus. And if that means getting rid of my money, so be it. I don't care about that. So he gives away half, then he's going to pay back anybody that he cheated four times the amount. That's a lot of his wealth walking right out the door in one public statement that he's going to have to follow through on. You can't go back on that when you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of people hear you make that claim. When, when we encounter Jesus, he, he confronts that thing in us. And for, for Zacchaeus, and, and maybe for many of us, and maybe this changes from day to day what it is that's keeping you from being surrendered to God, but maybe sometimes it's money. And Zacchaeus makes a switch. He goes from leveraging money, which is just a tool, right? Can we just agree money is a tool that God puts into our lives, into the world, that we can use this tool for good or for bad? Like a hammer, you can drive a nail to build a house, or you can bonk somebody on the head. You can use it for good or bad, right? Zacchaeus had gone from using money in a a way that was very selfish and actually hurt other people to using money in a way that was a blessing to people. Or you you could look at it this way. He, he actually pursued money in a way that cut him off from relationships with his own people. And it's, then he switched and chose to use money in a way that connected him to the poor. That was a, what a beautiful change. What a beautiful transformation that's happening in this guy because he has dinner with Jesus. That's the power of an encounter with Christ and what it has on our view of finances. And when we talk about bringing the kingdom of God mindset about money to earth, and Zacchaeus, he sets a high bar, doesn't he? But it's one that I think draws us. I think we, there's something in our hearts that stirs up at this idea of saying, I'm not going to let money control or define me. I, I told a story a few years ago about a friend here in the church who had come to me and said, hey, would you, would you pray for me? I, th- I think I'm going to I think I'm going to change jobs, and my, this is going to be a huge pay cut for me. But I think it's the right thing to do because it's going to give me more time with my family. And so, we, yeah, we prayed through it, and he made that decision, and he, he walked away from a very high-paying job to sort of a, more of an average-paying job. Average is always relative, right? Average is what I make, right? That's average. <laughs> so uh, it's relative. So he, he walked away from a high-paying job to a, to a lower-paying job for more time with his family. And I think God honored that in some ways. Um, that, that proved to be very valuable. Just recently, this same person came to me again and said, hey, I think, I think I'm, I'm going to change jobs again for a, another lower, uh, but it's going to be a lower paying job. I was like, we, we just did this, right? <laughs> we just did this a few years ago. You, you already cut your salary significantly. Yeah, I think I'm going to do it again. <laughs> but this time, it's because I, I think I found a job that's going to bring meaning and fulfillment. I'm going to be able to make an impact on other people. We pray through that, and he's making that move. And what that encourages, inspires me to do is like, it is actually possible to live, to interact with our finances in a way that it doesn't control or define us, but actually sets us free to do what God has gifted and called and created us to do. I got another story, because God is stirring something up uh, around us in our, in our community, I think, when it comes to this subject. I, I had lunch with uh, a friend recently, and he told me, that uh, God blessed him recently when he lost 90% of his investments. I was like, you're going to have to unpack that because that does not make sense. You actually, you use the, I think you're using the word bless wrong. I think what you mean is something else. He's like, no, I mean bless. God blessed me recently when I lost 90% of my investments. And he told me the number. And I was like, don't tell me the number. He told me the number. And it was a big number. It's, it's, it's more money than I've ever made in my life. He lost that 90%, that much, and called it a blessing. I was like, you got to unpack that. You got to tell me why you're calling that a blessing. He said, because I recognized as I was making this money, I was starting to feel a sense of pride about me. Like, this became something that I could do, and it was for me, and it was elevating my view of myself and how I thought other people should see me. And then he said, I also noticed after the pride came in some greed, and I started thinking about how to make more. And what? How much, how high could I go? How much could I make? 
And he said, the amazing thing that happened when I lost it is that nothing that was really important to me changed. My, my time with my family, still have that. My, in, my job, my opportunity to put good work into the world, still have that. Like, n- my faith, my, my ability to connect with my creator, nothing that was actually important to me changed. So it was a blessing to know. I don't need that. Like, okay, it may, maybe it was nice and, you know, something good to do if I, could, if I could leverage it for good, but I wasn't doing that. So it was a blessing that I lost 90% of my investment. It's like, man, love it. I love somebody being able to see what God is doing in an event that the rest of us would call a tragedy. He saw a blessing because it set him free in a way he didn't really know was possible. The good news about money, it's just a tool. It does not control or define us. But it does sort of matter what we do with it, right? So what should we do with it? Well, let's, let's read the next story. So Jesus is still sitting here. So he's, he's at Zacchaeus' house. He's been criticized for, for eating with a sinner. He says, you guys are totally misunderstanding why I'm here. This is why I'm here, to eat with sinners, to seek and save the lost. And then he, he, goes, he launches right into this story in the, the next verse, verse 11. While they were listening to him, he went on to tell uh, this parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in, reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Whew, that ends on a very unpleasant note, right? We're going we're gonna to take what he has, we're going to give to the one who already has 10, but that's not fair. Well, you know, life's not fair. That's kind of the message, right? What, what is Jesus trying to say here? Well, first of all, what, a lot of times we read these parables, and whenever there's a master, we go, oh, the master is God. Well, sometimes, and maybe. But the story Jesus tells is actually very similar to a historical event that took place in Judea 30 years before Jesus tells this story. So 30 years before this, Herod the Great... This was the guy that tried to have baby Jesus killed when the wise men came to town. Um, Herod the Great died, and his, his territory was divided up. And there was this uh, leader named Archelaus that was supposed to get Judea the, his, as his territory, where Jerusalem was, Jericho and all this was there. But he had to be affirmed by Caesar in order to take control of this territory, because Caesar's in charge. So he has to go to Rome, and he goes to Rome to get affirmed. The Jews hate Archelaus. They send a delegation of 50 people to go to Rome to protest Caesar's appointment of Archelaus over Judea. And uh, Caesar appoints him anyway, so Archelaus comes back, and things do not go well for the delegation of 50 that protested him. You always got to be careful protesting a tyrant, because if they win, you lose, right? So uh, this story would have popped immediately into the minds of Jesus' listeners. They, they would be like, oh, he's talking about Archelaus, because that's kind of what it sounded like. So Jesus tells a story about this, this leader who wants his servants to invest his money uh, in a way that pleases him, right? And what we see is that the master is not really all that concerned about how much they bring back, right? So one brings back 10, he's like, good job. One brings back five, he's like, good job. The one that's a problem is the one that doesn't bring back anything. He was too afraid to invest what he had been given, so he did nothing. So 
what the, the master is using this money as a test. He says, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, I'm going to give you a big responsibility, not just over money, but over people. And I wonder sometimes if God doesn't put resources into our lives to help us demonstrate what kind of people we really are. What kind of people are we going to be if we have this much money, this much time, this much giftedness? What kind of people are we going to be? What are we going to do with that? Because the reality is we can't do nothing. Doing nothing seems like the worst possible thing that the servant could have done. So when we acknowledge that God has given us resources, whether it's time or money or spiritual gifts, we have to ask, what are we going to do with this? Because we are responsible and accountable for what we do with what we have. We are responsible and accountable for what we do with what we have. I'm not responsible for what I don't have. I'm not responsible for what you have. Although, in, in my mind, we, we make decisions for other people. And if I, had, if I had what they have, I'd tell you what I would do with it, right? I'm not responsible for what you have. I'm responsible for what I have. And my job is to do with what I have something that pleases the master, that fits the purposes of the master. So what, what are my master's purposes? When he gives me resources, he gives me a tool like money, what, what can I do with it that pleases him? If only we knew what was most important to Jesus so we could know where to invest the gifts that he's given us. That was sarcasm and joke, so... Perk up a little, folks. We're almost there. We we know exactly what was most important to Jesus because somebody asked him and he told him, here's what's most important. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So whatever resources we have, time, money, gifts, are to be leveraged for loving God and loving people, that's it. That's what pleases the master. That that's, aligns with the purposes for which God gave us these resources to begin with. And we are accountable and responsible for what we do with what we have. So what do we do with what we have? I want to take just a minute to kind of back up and address the reality that there are people, maybe in this room, who don't have. I mean, the reality is not everyone has enough to meet their bills this month. That's how our world works. Maybe if there are not a lot of them in this room, there's a lot of them in our community. There are people all around us who don't have enough. So what about them? What are they responsible and accountable for? This is where the church takes responsibility for those who don't have enough. That's how it was set up. The church takes responsibility for those who don't have enough. That's our job. That's how it was set up from the beginning. In the early church, if you read Acts, especially the end of Acts chapter 2 and the end of Acts chapter 4, what you see is some crazy language, like there were no needy persons among them. Not because the gospel was a gospel for the rich, but because the gospel inspired people to give away what they had. There were no needy persons among them because they brought all their extra and they gave it to the apostles and said, take care of the needs of the church. So that's exactly what the apostles did. There were no needy persons among them because the church took responsibility for the people who didn't have enough. Friends, that's, that's how we're set up today. Our Sister Road Christian Church is set up to take care of the needs of the people in our church family. Uh, we call it benevolence. We have this benevolence account. That's a percentage of, um, of the giving. So a percentage of whatever you guys contribute um, goes into this benevolence fund. And that fund is there so that anyone who asks for help from the church, we're able to help them. And based on that percentage, I think our amount last year was like $9,000. Whatever we don't use, if we don't use it all, it rolls over to the next year. We rolled over $4,000 from last year because we didn't give it all away. To me, that is crazy. Do, are there no needs in our church? Are there need, no needs in our community? Of course there are needs. Well, why aren't we giving away all of our benevolence money? Well, a couple of reasons. One is... Um, a lot of times, people who are in need don't like to ask. It's, it's just, it just feels bad. It feels bad to ask for help. We've kind of created a culture where that's, that's not cool. You're, don't be a burden. Or this is nobody else's business. This is my business. We'll figure it out. But I think the real issue is that people can have needs and no one else knows it. 
Why, how is that possible in the church family? That someone in our church has a need that no one else knows about. That is a failure on our part to connect with each other and care for each other in meaningful ways. There should be no one in our church family who has a need that somebody else doesn't know about because we are loving each other actively throughout the week. We get to know each other. Everyone is known. Everyone is loved. So if I have a need, you know it. If you have a need, I know it. That's what should be happening. So I want to see us give away all of our benevolence money. So that's going to require some people who need to ask. And it's going to require all of us to get connected with the people around us so deeply that if they need something, they don't have to ask. We know. And we make sure it gets taken care of. When the funds are there and they don't get used, that's on us. we got to find a way to make that happen. I am happy to report <laughs> that our benevolence team was able to help a young family uh, this weekend pay two months of rent because they had some crazy situations, the health of their baby, and a lot of weird stuff happened, and they just, they just couldn't make it happen this the last couple months. So we're going to take care of it. No questions asked, because that's what it's for. The church takes responsibility for those that don't have enough. So what about those who do have enough? There are a lot of wise sayings in the Bible about money. I encourage you to go read through Proverbs. I don't think you could get through a whole page of the book of Proverbs without coming across something about money. So let me summarize for you kind of the four big messages of Proverbs uh, when it comes to money. Uh, don't be lazy. Don't exploit the poor. Uh, avoid debt and be generous, okay? Those are the four big messages of Proverbs. Don't be lazy. Don't exploit the poor. Avoid debt. Be generous, okay? It's pretty much, you guys got that? Write that down. It's all common sense stuff. Here's, here's the way we did it in our family when, when we were trying to teach our kids about money. We kind of recognized our parents didn't do a good job of explaining money to us and showing us what to do. So we were like, we're going to change that. So um, when our kids were small, uh, we would give them an allowance of like $5. And so I don't remember if it was weekly or monthly or rarely birthdays. Okay, come on. <laughs> you did too. Don't you throw me under the bus right now. I'll... All right. They would get five $1 bills, and they had these little uh, um, container things that had three drawers in them. And we labeled each drawer, um, give, save, spend. And the instruction was, you have to put at least $1 in each drawer. And the idea was that before you get your next allowance, the give drawer should be empty. You got to empty the give drawer. We don't, we don't stock up give money. We give that away because that's what give means. <laughs> it was really simple. And then with the save and spend, we would talk about, you know, what, what, do you, what do you need to spend on? What are you saving for? Those kind of things. I think when we grow, when we become adults, our um, budgets become so complicated that it's like, we, we don't even know where to draw the lines between these three things. But what if we could just simplify? We could, what if we just could look at what God has given us financially and say, I, I, I want to give. I need to save and I'm going to have to spend some to live indoors and eat. So let's do those three things in a way that demonstrates our love for God and our love for people. So I don't know. That's a simple concept. Uh, maybe it's helpful for you. The goal is we can't, we can't do nothing. We have to do something. Um, I just want to share with you what kind of the Coulter family journey with this in the last um, several months. My wife and I started praying about this uh, several months ago. I, one of the things that we longed for was to simplify our lives. We kind of felt our lives getting cluttered up with just, we're, we're busy all the time, and we, we want to have some more space, some more margin to, to connect with people, to be generous. So one of the ideas we came up with to simplify our lives and create some more space was to downsize our house. So we put our house on the market this past week. We're under contract today. Um, we're selling our house to move into something smaller. Let me be really clear, because... Somebody's going to spread a rumor that Adam's moving to Montana. I'm not moving anywhere, staying in Cicero, love Cicero. We're just downsizing our house. And I don't, this is not for everybody, okay? This is just the cultures. This is just kind of where, where we are and what God's doing for us. I don't think that you should do this. I don't really think God cares what size house you live in, okay? I, I'm not sure that, that he's measuring square footage and going, ah, that's a little over the line. What God cares about is our hearts, Right? He cares about our hearts. And for us and our hearts, we need to simplify right now. And so that's, that's kind of our journey. And it's going to be some changes, and some of them we'll like and some of them we won't like. But what I hope that we get to experience is enough space and margin financially to be more generous, to be able to use what God has given us, take this tool that God has blessed us with, and leverage it 
in a way that demonstrates love for God and love for people. That's what we want to do. And I just want to invite you. We're, we're going to pray. We're going to have a prayer here just for in a minute. And I want to invite you to ask. I, I said before, whenever we encounter Jesus, he confronts the thing in us that is most likely to create an obstacle between us and God. If that obstacle for you is sometimes money, if sometimes your anxiety, your fear, your pride, your greed gets between you and full devotion to God, then this is a prayer that you need to pray along with me this morning. God, how, how, can, we, how can we get this obstacle out of the way? I don't want to be defined by or controlled by my finances. I, I, want, I want to get this out of the way so I can be fully devoted to you. Help me to use, help me to be responsible for and accountable for what I do with what I have and to leverage it in a way that loves God, loves people. Would you pray that prayer with me this morning? Let's, let's bow our heads. God, we thank you so much that you have provided us. Um, we, we live in a community. We, we have a church family. We're, we, we have a lot of people here. We, ha- we have extra. We have more than we actually need. And there's no reason why our finances should become an obstacle between us and you, but it happens all the time. God, would you work in our hearts this morning? Shape us, change us, spur us to new, risky, crazy, bold action that will help us to honor you with what we have, to leverage what we have in a way that loves others. And would you equip our church to take responsibility for the people who don't have enough? Would you do that in us and through us, Father? To your glory, in Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm excited to report to you that we have a baptism this morning. A young lady named Casey is uh, surrendering her life to Christ today, and uh, Amber is going to walk us through that. So I invite you to, oh, there they are. Let me get out of the way. No matter what she's doing, she puts her whole heart into it, and she just steps into that as herself, which is the best. Um, So, Casey, could you tell us a little bit about what Jesus means to you? Uh, He's just done a lot for me, and I love him, and I want to be closer to him. That's awesome. All right, I'm going to take your confession of faith, so I just need you to repeat after me, okay? I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I choose to accept Him. And I choose to accept Him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Okay. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! <laughs>